Hello, I'm Dave Moitz, and welcome to this special edition of Successful Farming, devoted entirely to classic tractors. On today's program, I'm heading to auction to see what one of the hottest tractors on the market is worth today. The engine man, Ray Bohax, offers a great restoration tip. We're going on a tractor ride in the gorgeous Lust Hills in western Iowa. And after these brief messages, we tour the fantastic collection of Oliver, White, and Mini Mo tractors amassed by the Prizel family in Wisconsin. So please stay tuned. If you've been following antique tractors, you've noticed that more tractors from the 1960s, even the early 1970s, are showing up in collections. And in fact, in my tractor value reports that I do on the show, I'm beginning to see farmers as well as tractor collectors going after chore tractors from this era of the 60s and 70s. I was talking to Dan Preisel, who collects tractors with your father Gary and brother Chad, and you're the tractor doctor too, and do restorations, as well as buy and sell tractors. And I'm really interested not only in your collection, but your views of what's happening with what we would call the muscle tractor craze. And certainly that's reflected in what you have in your collection. You've gone after the bigger tractors that were front wheel assist only, right? Correct, that's uh, the main focal point of our collection. Um, and it's kind of how you're saying, how things are changing. Um, we kind of jumped in before anybody else was really looking at the mechanical fronts. Right. Um, guys were still looking at the smaller stuff and uh, 50s and early 60s stuff. Um, when them were really hot, well, you jump in the next one that nobody's really looking at yet and try and get ahead of everybody. Dan, when I was out here, we were trying to recall. We, we featured some tractors in your collection eight, nine, ten years ago. It was the smaller what the triple digit Olivers that you had, you had some Minneapolis Moline, how your collection has changed uh, since that time then? Because it's mostly the larger horsepowers. Correct, yeah, at that time it was a lot of the two and three digit Olivers that we had. Um, kind of got away from them and just kind of liked the mechanical fronts. Um, went to that, more rare seemed to be, um, and just kind of the more higher horsepowered. Um, more desirable tractors. It seems like the, the generation shift of the collectors, it seemed as that was the next thing to come up, so we kind of started to get into them. Now, you're not just restricted to Olivers, though. Nope. Uh, we have uh, basically the Oliver line, uh, the Olivers, the Molines that were the same as the Olivers, as long as along with the Cockshuts. Um, we do also have one John Deere, one Case, and one Ford in here at the moment. And then the others that you have are the white tractors then, that uh, those tra three tractor lines eventually just were merged into white. Right? Correct, yep. And you even, now white tractors are collectible. Yep, and even them we're starting to see kind of guys get into the newer ones. It almost seems like another shift in the collection or the generations. Um, we've even started now to pick up a lot of the Series 3 mechanical fronts. Uh, just because the Series 3 were right at the tail end before the Cummins engine right. um, started getting put in all the whites. Um, and the Series 3 were just the more updated and they made fewer years of them than the whole, the older brand. Are you seeing what used to be just Oliver collectors are now buying white tractors because that was the predecessor, uh, the successor I mean to Oliver? And are those guys also getting the minis as well because it's all one big family or do they mostly still stay Oliver? It's, it's weird with the Molines. They're, them guys kind of seem to stay, if they're the older Moline guys, they stay with the Molines. Um, but like the Oliver guys, we've seen a few of them now that they're migrating into the whites. Um, and then it was real hard with the early cockshut guys when they were still cockshuts, they kind of stayed with. They didn't migrate to the once Oliver and White had purchased them. Oh, so you'll see collections that are like yours where you have the Olivers of that vintage, but the cockshut that were being produced under the Oliver name, but still sold as a cockshut tractor then. Correct. You just like to have the complete line as Correct. part of the whole deal. Yep. So are there some whites that you're looking for that you kind of are eyeing to add to the collection that way? Um, I think uh, on the white side, I think we've got just about everything that we've 
got right now. Um, we got a 288 mechanical. Um, might be one where you'd look at getting a two-wheel drive one. Yeah. Um, otherwise, we have seen guys even two now starting like even the workhorse series two-wheel drive ones because they didn't make hardly any. We've seen a couple of 195 white two-wheel drives. So we can expect, no matter what the color is, guys are going to start looking at those later 70s and 80s tractors because I just had a Ford collector contact me the other day and he was all hot after a, a Ford 8000 and he wanted to get the 9000 too to complete it out. Shoot, those are tractors I grew up with. But then that answers the question, doesn't it? If yep. I had the tractor I'd like to own, I'd like to own a 6000 or an 8000 Ford, for example. Yep. It's a tractor that I grew, kind of grew up with after we got off the John Deere A, so. Yep, it almost seems like that's how guys first start. Their first one is, well, it was either grandpa's tractor, he bought it new, or dad bought it new, or just something they grew up on all the time and drove, and then it just kind of snowballs and it grows on you. Talk about the business that you operate too. The tractor doctor is, you were doing more repair for farmers, but now you're spending more of your time on tractor restoration, for sure. Correct, yep, for years we were basically strictly just repair, buy and sell for farmers. Um, we'd do our own collection rest restorations on the side. Um, it got to the point now where I'm sure it's all the way across the country, the smaller farms are dying, the bigger guys are taking over. Um, so we needed to kind of move on and after doing our own restorations for how many years, we figured, well, we might as well start doing them for other people. You'd be deeply experienced in restorations because you've taken on some massive restorations with all the tractors that you have in your in your fleet. So, uh, and then also you buy and sell tractors. If guys are looking for an Oliver, they can get a hold of you. If it, it, well, it might be in your collection, but it might be also something you know about then. Correct, well. correct. yep. Um, we got guys all the time calling us, uh, looking for one of these. If you hear one, let us know. Um, we, we know guys all the way across the country in Canada that we have bought from or we know where to get all stuff. So, yep, the contacts you gain throughout the years right. helps out. So if people wanted to get a hold of you, how, what's the best way to do that? Uh, the easiest thing, uh, all our contact information would be on our website. Uh, it'd be tractor-dr.com. It was great talking with you, Dan, and it was really great catching up both with your family after we haven't been here for all these years, but to see what has happened to your collection and what's going on with the muscle tractors. You know, for more information about the muscle tractor craze, you can go to agriculture.com slash TV. Hello, Ray Vohax here for Ageless Iron Antique Tractor Tip. I'm over at the Firestone Test Farm in Columbiana, Ohio, where Harvey Firestone started to do all of his research on the pneumatic tire. So it's really appropriate that we bring this all together in this Ageless Iron segment. Now I'm gonna ask you a question, be honest with me. Do you use the internet? Do you use a cell phone? I'm assuming that you said yes. And if that is the case, then why are you not using modern technology to adjust the carburetor on your antique tractor? The proper way to adjust the carburetor would be to integrate modern technology. And it is very simple if you know what to do. You have to make a minimal investment and in this air to purchase an air fuel meter. This is an Innovate model air fuel meter that I sourced from Summit Racing and it's only $288 and we're gonna use it as a tool. And what it does is that it has a wiring harness, it has an oxygen sensor, and a bung that needs to be welded into the pipe. And then once you do that and have that, it, this is gonna be installed as a tool. It's not gonna be installed on a tractor all the time. And you're gonna use it as a tool and you're gonna be able to adjust the idle mixture and more importantly, the mixture under load to get the proper, what is called stoichiometric air fuel ratio, the proper mixture of air and fuel to have the best chemical to mechanical energy exchange. I'm gonna go over this very briefly because it is, it is very simplistic. I have a piece of exhaust pipe here. If you do not want to weld the bung onto your tractor exhaust system, you could buy a piece of pipe, attach this to the tailpipe, and put the bung in here and use this as a tool to go from tractor to tractor, and then have the air fuel meter hooked up. The bung would be welded into here, the oxygen sensor would go in here, there's the appropriate wiring harnesses that are all plug and play, you just thread them in, 
and then you would hook this up to battery voltage. There is a caveat though. Even though they say it runs down to eight volts, you'd probably want to just hook it up temporarily to a 12 volt battery, just so that you have a, hot, a stronger signal going into it. And then you would have, a, this is not powered up, but you would have a reading on here of what the air fuel ratio is. You'd want an air fuel ratio of around 14 to one, 13.5, 14.2, 14.5 and it's a combination of what the air fuel ratio is and how the tractor runs. This is really a great way of doing it because it takes all of the guesswork out. And you know exactly what the air fuel ratio is. If you could take the oxygen sensor back out, they give you a plug for the bung and nobody knows the wiser. And you would be able to have that thing running like, like it was meant to run on today's modern gasoline. So you have a blessed day and I want to see these tractors with the air fuel ratio being checked with a meter. Join me at auction to see what one of the hottest tractors in the market is worth today after these brief messages. Welcome to Steel Deals. When I'm not busy running around to auctions or writing for Successful Farming Magazine, I'm editor of the Aegis Iron Almanac, a publication dedicated to the great vocation of collecting vintage tractors. And when I say vocation, I mean it. Collecting antique tractors is a passion for hundreds of thousands of people, including me. This is why when I was inspecting equipment at today's auction, I stopped at this International 1066. Not long ago, a tractor like this would have been bought by a farmer looking for a chore tractor or an acreage owner. But in the last decade, tractors like this muscle tractor are being snatched up by collectors. This tractor is in solid shape. It's coming off a farm that had used it for the last 35 years. But the 414 engine in this tractor had been changed out with a 436 engine out of an IH combine. Now, this motor also has 5,500 hours on it. So I wonder if that change out will have an effect on its value. Well, before this tractor sells, I'm gonna go talk to Sullivan Auctioneer's machinery expert, Dan Sullivan, and get his opinion on today's sale. Dan, we're having some fun today. We looked at that 1066 Turbo. Now, if I were at an auction like that 10 years ago, that'd be a chore tractor. Uh, collectors are going after them now. What's with that? Absolutely. You know, it's all about timing. And, uh, so, you know, one day they're using it as, as a farm shore tractor, and now they're trying to put them in the tractor collection. Those 66 series tractors, wow. We've sold some pretty high ones this past winter. It is amazing to see what the prices have done with those, and that's because of the interest in what they call muscle tractors. You know, it used to be John Deere A's. Now we're getting the 100 horsepower tractors, and they seem to attract a lot of attention. Have you oh, noticed that too? Absolutely. The, the, those 66 series tractors have drawn attention all over the place. And you know, the commodity prices do not affect that size and that series of a tractor like would it, if they were buying it for farm use or something. So definitely a lot of interest out there, a lot of interest on the internet on that tractor and to be interested to see what it brings. Man, if I had to put you on the spot, what do you think it might bring for a top bid? Oh, I think that 1066 today, I'm going to say that tractor will bring somewhere in that between that nine and 10,000 range. We've sold a few, we've sold a few of them this winter for 15 to 20,000. Uh, this one does ha has had an engine replaced and, uh, and maybe not quite as sharp as some of those we sold, but there's a lot of activity on it, a lot of interest in it. So I guess I'm going to say either side of 10,000. Well, Dan, thanks for that information. Let's go watch that 1066 Turbo Cell. Nice deal right here. I'm at about 35, so how does the 8750 given for this 1066 compare to recent sales of similar tractors well i found four 1066s that sold in the last three months and they went for 2400 dollars up to 49,500. yes you heard right 49,500. 
Now that high tractor was restored and equipped with a very, very rare front wheel drive system. So let's throw that one out and narrow our search to unrestored tractors like this 1066. Now auction sales prices on such tractors range from $2,400 for a very rough tractor up to $10,300. Now let's throw that very, very rough tractor out. So now I've narrowed the search range down to tractors that match this one. No cab, fresh from the farm. Now our price range narrows from $4,700 up to $7,800. So that tells me the person who bought this 1066 got a fairly good deal on the tractor at today's sale. See, that's the great display of the internet. You can do detailed research into past sales and feel more confident about what you want to pay. If you want to do some internet searching, I would highly recommend going to the following sites. And they include rbauction.com, tractorhouse.com, fastline.com, and ironsearch.com. For more information about Sullivan Auctioneers, you can go to their website at sullivanauctioneers.com. And you can catch my steel deals reports in every issue of Successful Farming Magazine. Join me again next week on another steel deals report. Join me after these messages on a tractor ride in the Lust Hills of Western Iowa. So please stay tuned. ride to the Los Hills. A group of us, six of us, seven, eight, nine of us in the beginning uh, started making a trip through the hills and each year it got to be longer and longer. There's so much scenic beauty through the hills. Uh, we just want to share it with other friends and riders and uh, we had the tractors. We all had tractors so it was time to go. A lot of these riders are repeating year after year. Uh, of course, most of them are within 75 to 100 miles of here. The scenery in the hills are something they don't see except once a year. They've got to drive through here. We welcome all the tractors. Uh, hopefully they all run. Uh, I had a problem a little while ago, but uh, it makes no difference to us if they're painted up or not painted, as long as they're good runnable tractors and, and get around the route. I think a lot of people feel they want to paint the tractors. Uh, I've done that to uh, sharpen them up, make them look a little nicer, like having a new car. But the Lust Hills, of course, as you may know, are the only set of Lust Hills other than in China. And that attracts people here uh, to see the Lust Hills. We have tourism now going through the Lust Hills with bus routes. and. Uh, scenic beauty of this part of Iowa is something a lot of people haven't found yet. And the more we can expose that with our tractor rides, we have people here from Des Moines, uh, Central Iowa, Southwest Iowa, Northwest Iowa, and uh, they come to, to enjoy the hills and see the scenery. They're not used to this, this kind of terrain. We pick out the most scenic roads we can find, uh, the hills, the curves, the trees, we have a lot of forest cover on our trip, a lot of trees that shroud the road, and uh, it just makes it beautiful. We have some pretty steep hills to go down, some to go up, sharp curves, so our riders uh, hopefully are all experienced, uh, not always for the steep hills up or down, but uh, we seem to get along pretty good. And I guess between I and a couple of friends locally, we strive to put it on to accommodate them and, and have a good time. It's going to be a nice day to go. Please join us next week for another outstanding show. Laura Bedord reveals how farmers are using ag precision technology to help in soil conservation. The shark farmer, Rob Sharkey, is back with his unique perspective on agriculture. I had to auction to track the sale late model Peterbilt 386 semis. And on All Around the Farm, we show a slick way to remove bearings that was invented by a farmer. See you next week 
on successful farming. Hi, I'm Dave Mowitz. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, hit subscribe right here if you haven't already, and click that little bell right here to be notified when we post a new video. And click here to see more great episodes from Successful Farming Television.